morning and welcome. My name is Sheila McKinnon. I'm the lead minister here at First Metropolitan, and I greet you this morning from an empty sanctuary as we continue our own practice of social distancing and staying at home. I want to thank the few people who are here this morning, nobody who is not necessary. You won't see Bruce or Trison or Joan, but they are here too. Kelly and Leanne, David and Mary will be leading in the services. So there will be pauses between things as we make sure that we maintain the six feet of distance. Wherever you are this morning, however you are dressed, whether you have a coffee, and I hope so, or if you're sitting at home in your jammies, we hope that you know that we are thinking of you in these extraordinary times. The land we worship on is the land of the Coast Salish nations. The United Church as a denomination, we in particular as a congregation, wish, wish to always acknowledge that this is their continuing heritage. We are grateful to be on this beautiful land this morning, and we pray for the day of right relations with the First Nations, with the Métis Nations, and with the Inuit people. May it be so. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leanne Clark, and I am First Metropolitan United Church's treasurer. In these ever-changing times, announcements become out of date the second they are made. So my only announcement this morning is to check the First Met website every few days to make sure you don't miss any news about fellow congregants or any updates on when activities will start up again. I will now light the Christ candle to remind us of Jesus' presence among us.
you are, would you pray with me? O God, who gives us the morning sun and the evening star, we come together in new and different ways to praise you. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, O God, who over and over again brings us out of darkness into light, out of winter into springtime, out of death into life. We celebrate you, God of grace, giver of gifts. Bless us, we pray, as we seek to respond to the gift of Easter's resurrection joy. All praise to you for your gift of gifts. Amen. Mary is doing our children's story this morning. And here we are, a day or a Sunday after Easter, and the study for Sunday school today is Mary's arrival at the empty tomb of Jesus. Now, some of you will know that my mother has recently passed away, and it was quite a sudden passing. We hadn't, we didn't even know this year, this time last year, that by Christmas she would be gone. And as she came close to leaving this earth, she started to tell my sister and I stories. So actually quite a lovely time. And she would say things like, when you go to my house, you will find. And some of the things she said we would find were in the category of, and dear, don't be surprised. Some of them were more don't forget to look for. And so in the months since she's passed and my sister and I have been at her house, that house has felt like an empty tomb. And so when I step into her house, I feel I have a little bit of the sense that Mary must have had arriving at that empty tomb on Easter morning. Jesus was not ready to leave his friends. His friends were not ready to have him leave. My mother was not ready to leave. I was not ready for my mother to leave. And yet, here we are in this completely unexpected situation. And so, as my sister and I have been sort of wandering around the house, wondering what to do and opening up doors and pulling out drawers and finding things, things that were surprising to us that my mother had kept, she still has... And oh, heavens, it was very ugly. The cake topper from her wedding cake. And my sister and I had long discussions. Do we keep it? Don't we keep it? It was precious to my mother. We've decided to keep it. But the thing that perhaps made me gasp the most when I pulled open a door, drawer, was this. So... Up on the screen, you'll see a couple of pictures. Joan, I'll let you go back two of them. So this is a picture of my mother with my grandfather. And what I found, and we'll show you up close in a moment, was that my mother had kept my grandfather's baby quilt from 1911. I didn't even know she had this quilt. And so this quilt not only was for my grandfather in 1911, but it was made, and Joan, you can turn the next picture, by my great-grandmother, who's on the far left side of your picture there. My great-great-grandmother, 
And my great-great-grandfather had Im immigrated from Spain in 1910. The day after my grandmother was released from Ellis Island in New York City, a friend of the family came up, picked her up, and took her to where my great-great-grandfather was staying or was working in West Virginia. They were married the next day, and exactly nine months later, my grandfather was born. And so I can only imagine that as my grandmother, great-great-grandmother, sorry, great-grandmother, was doing this quilt, and Joan, you can push that picture forward now. When she was working on this quilt, the newness in her life, she was newly immigrated, and we know that's not easy. She was about to be a new parent, and we know that's not easy. And yet she made this beautiful quilt with these adorable little teddy bears. Joan, would you like to show the close-up? Lovingly hand-stitched. And so, I asked my sister for permission to bring this back with me because, end of July, I'm going to become a grandmother. And this now becomes part of the next generation story in my family. And isn't that that open, empty tomb experience? Mary arrives at the tomb of Jesus. She thinks it's empty. But what's really there are the stories and the teachings, and the heritage, and the things that Jesus left with his disciples to carry forth. And we still tell those stories today. Just like my mom kept and treasured her father's baby quilt. And that now will pass down the generations. So, with that, we'll sing our children's song, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. 
Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is part of our story. Thanks be to God. If this was a regular year, and it's not, this would be Earth Sunday. And so I love the picture of the hands holding the earth. The scripture that we just heard from St. John often is called Doubting Thomas. I want to reframe that, and Mary's children's story just works perfectly. I want to call it Persevering Thomas. Because he didn't share that initial experience. He didn't have that first time of faith of the risen Christ. But he persevered with the community. He continued with the community, and then it was his chance a week later. We call him Doubting Thomas, but let's acknowledge something else about him. He persevered with that gang, with that group. One of our spiritual gifts, and this is a time when we've been reflecting on our spiritual toolbox, is tenacity or perseverance. These are challenging times. Here at First Met, we are trying to respond as a family of faith and as an organization with a large, beautiful sanctuary and an empty Christian education building. Like all of you, we have been rearranging, reassuring, and rescheduling from home. I am grateful for the helpful leadership of the board and key volunteers, the support, dexterity, and good humor of our community of faith. I am grateful for every volunteer and staff member who has acted to ensure that each member of our First Met family, our community of faith, is cared for and that we live out our commitments to each other. Phone calls, emails, Zoom meetings, and prayers are the constants that keep us connected to each other and reminding each other of the steadfast love of God. As you can see from the empty sanctuary and the cancelled signs out front that are everywhere displayed, we are committed to the physical distancing for the common good and for the love of our neighbors. We want to flatten the curve and at the same time care for the most vulnerable in these trying times. As Dr. Tam says, let's plank that curve. I am proud of our efforts even as I grieve with you all for the many losses of the human family at this time. We pray for the day when we can have a soup social after church, when it is once again safe to do so. Until then, we are devising even more ways to encourage each other by sharing our faith, our creativity, our recipes, and our ideas for coping. While we do this, we are mindful of our world and the crises that COVID-19 has created on multiple levels. The news from places I have never visited may in fact be the very place where your parents were born and you may still have relatives there. We are all doing what we can to help our community of faith 
and our neighbors locally and globally. Together we can and will get through this. When we work together, we can be a team that is unstoppable, undaunted, and unbeatable. How do we do that? By working as a team. And so when one gets tired and needs reassurance, we are here to provide that. And we can step up when others are tired. I was intrigued to hear about Mary's grandfather's quilt. Because I, this week, have also been doing something a little bit parallel to her work. I have a box of things I've carried around with me for years called Stuff from Dad's Desk. Some of these things are bewildering. Why did we keep these? And other than are so touching. And I wanted to share with you a letter. You know that copy script? Copy, but they had copper script in the 1800s. So in July, July 1st, 1873, a relative of mine by the name of James Kerr wrote a letter to his daughter. Now, James Kerr, for those of you who are better at genealogy than I am, James Kerr was my grandfather's cousin's grandfather. So my grandfather was born in a Cabreton in East Lake Ainsley. This branch of the McKinnons with the Kerrs were from Chatham, New Brunswick. But the letter was written from Sable Island, which is a little sliver of land off the coast of Nova Scotia. And in, 19, no, in 1873, James Kerr was building a lighthouse. He was lonely. His daughter, to whom this letter originally was sent, had missed the steamer. He hadn't had mail for months. In fact, they had been waiting for supplies. He filled his days staying in touch with the other people building. They were building two lighthouses at that time on Sable Island, which is famous now for its feral horses. And they were constantly having things wash up on the shore from the numerous shipwrecks that had taken place over the years. He pleaded with his daughter to look after the home, to write to him if she could. He said, stay in touch with their community there in Chatham. Make sure that the church was running well and that his church tithe was paid in full. He wasn't sure when he'd be back, but he wanted that to be maintained in his absence. He ended by trying to establish again his deep love for his daughter and their families and also for his community. The letter was dated from July 1st to the end of August as he kept on being interrupted and there was no steamer to come to pick up the mail. I went to Wikipedia to look up Sable Island just to see how long it was compared to Bowen Island where I used to live and a little note caught my attention. It said Sable Island had not had any shipwrecks since 1875, marking the completion of the two lighthouses built in 1873. I was thinking about James Kerr's tenacity and how he held on, not knowing that well over a hundred years later, people would still be remarking on the impact of his work that he kept on during very difficult times. He stayed the course. He wrote to his daughter his love in maintaining their relationships. He cared for his community, and he wanted to still be a contributing member of his church. And those were the four pillars, what kept him going at that time. It reminded me of a phrase that we use now in the 21st century, which says, start where you are, Use what you've got. Do what you can. I thought that Kerr's tenacity came a little bit of those things. Start where you are. He was lonely. Many of us are lonely. Use what you've got. 
He wrote. We have phones and emails, Zoom. And then finally, do what you can, use what you've got. That's what we're trying to do today. You and I will rise to this challenge, I believe, just as our people have. Was it by quilting a continuity with a family left behind in another continent? We've stood up to loneliness, frustration, disappointment, physical and mental challenges by reaching out and remembering those we love. And we can do that with those who are still alive, and we can do that as Mary was saying, with those who have passed on. Realizing that our actions today are creating our legacy in ways about which we will never know. So just in closing, I wanted to have a look at some of the legacy projects that we have done just in the last couple of years. Kathy and Janet have led us to work with the congregation at St. John the Divine with refugee work. That's a legacy work. Those families will always tell how they came to Canada. The knitters here have made sweaters and organized kits for the families that are being reached out to by the Cridge Center for the Family. They will not know who to thank. But don't you think that when they look back on a dark, hard time, they'll remember and then some hand-knit sweaters were delivered. This congregation has sent off, our treasurer could tell you how much, thousands of dollars, the Mission and Service Fund of the National Church. This year, we were able to partner with one of the grants that church grant money gives, right down here at our place, with Haley McGregor's excellent program for the 55-plus group. Seniors, most at risk and most vulnerable, we have been able to pick up where we can. The community around, the community of which we're a part, and the enduring community relationships within us, all of them support our legacy, encourage us with the gift of lived tenacity as we go through our own tough times. May they give us the, re the resources we need. May our faith root us. May our love ground us. And may our hope lift us in the days ahead. May it be so.
um, uh, in 2019, First Metropolitan United Church gave over $51,000 to Mission and Service Fund. Let us pray. I would like to thank everyone who is supporting First Met right now, whether it be by phoning and staying in touch with fellow congregants or by providing financial support through PAR, post-dated checks, mailed-in checks, or Canada Helps. We dedicate our time and financial resources to your service, O oh God. And now in unison, as sisters and brothers in the community of faith, we are blessed to be an Easter people, and for a time, this congregation of First Met is our home. We celebrate God's presence, and for God's voice, and seek to discern God's will. And now let us pray in the oh, Holy One. We ask your blessing on the ways we have responded to your presence in our lives. And now, in the words Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. God of the universe, we praise your great long work of creation the moment of glory when our universe began, the birth and burning of the first brilliant stars, the star's explosion into blazing supernovas, the formation of our sun from scattered bits of dust, the emergence of earth, the wonder of water, and there, in the waters, the miracle of life. We praise you, your long, great work of creation, the unfolding of plant and animal life, the development of human body and brain, and all the marvels of human creativity, our rapidly expanding knowledge and technology, our coming to understand where we have come from and all that we are intimately part of. We praise your great, long work of creation. God of the universe, we thank you for your billions of years of making in bringing this to be. May we live in the awareness of your magnificent and ongoing creation. May we live in ways that honor your work. May we be agents of your continuing creation. Blessed be. Amen.
and I both made reference to the collection of things we inherit from the generations that have gone before us. Here at First Met, we have a wonderful archive of all the things we've done. But you know, there's going to be a gap. There will be no bulletins to look at for Easter of this year. No Palm Sunday bulletin, because it was just done virtually. And so the gaps are maybe as important as the actual paper. Because if anyone asks about the gap, may they say of us, that's when they worshipped differently, but in continuation. That's when they did it in an empty sanctuary, but with a full heart. As we go into this week, may you know that you are surrounded by the tenacity of the generations that went before, whose story and courage and love is for us today a newfound resource. May the love of the God of creation the Christ who was resurrected, and the Holy Sacred Spirit who knits us all together, be with us all today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.